done an awesome job. Uh, they've been playing that, uh, playing the music. Um, they've been up here singing. That's the hard part, if you ask me. That's where it gets difficult to come up here because talking is no big deal because you just say it, it's done. But singing, there's you're talking longer. You're holding notes out, and that takes skill. And I'm glad somebody has it. Uh, I will do the talking part because that's easier for me than the singing part. So. Um, they did a great job this morning. It just makes Easter that much sweeter when that music plays and it reminds us of uh, what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 27 with me this morning, um, we want to talk about an empty promise that was made. And um, there is a play on words here, but I, I want us to catch, the, it could have gone either way. An empty promise it was, it was an empty promise. It was either the promise of an empty tomb or it would have been an empty promise if he didn't do what he said he was going to do. So either way, we have an empty promise here. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And we thank you for joining us for Easter morning. Thank you for spending Easter with us. Um, there are so many thoughts that go into this day and what it's all about. Some people see it as a celebration of the spring season. <laughs> well, that's out. <laughs> uh, here in Missouri, we just don't do things like normal. We have snow coming down outside. Now that it's finally spring, now we're starting to see the snow. Um, but some people think this is just a celebration of the spring season. That's what Easter's about because they don't know the meaning. They don't know the backstory of what Easter is all about. And some people really believe that it's just about the spring season. And some see, people see it with all the commercialism that comes with it. It's the time of the year for the Easter bunny and those marshmallow peeps. That's, that's what's coming around this time of year. And people see it like, yeah, see, start seeing those peeps. We know Easter's coming. You know, and they just see it. That's just a reminder of what Easter is. And that's how they see it. Some of you are here because you want to celebrate the true meaning of Easter and you grew up doing so. You understand what Easter is about and that's why you came today is because you want to help, you want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But there is something very unique about Easter. It's one of the most popular days of the year for church attendance. Now that's, of all the traditions that we do on different holidays, Easter's the one. Christmas also falls in, but Easter's the top attended service of the year. This is, this is the time that uh, people just come to church. People come to hear the greatest story of all human history. They come to church for this reason. They want to hear the greatest, and I mean the greatest story in the history of mankind. That is what we celebrate on Easter. My question is, do we really want to hear the truth about the events of this day and the reason why we celebrate it, or are we just here for the, the sake of Easter tradition? You know, are we here just because it's Easter? And that's just part of the tradition. We go to church on Easter. and I mean, churches have more people in them today than any other day of the year. And I'm grateful for that. I, I really am glad. And I'm okay with whatever reason you showed up today. Whatever reason you came through that door, I am thankful for because you're here. And God knows exactly who is going to be here. He knows exactly what you need in your life. And God's word, this is a custom-made service. And since you are here, it was custom-made for you. God knew where you needed to be. God, God made everything possible for you to get here this morning. And I'm really glad that you're here. I'm really glad that you're here. Now, I, I love bratwursts. It's a pretty nice segue, isn't it? It worked out really well. I mean, the transition was just smooth. I love bratwursts. The segues around here are just amazing. I like it when they sit on the grill and get to the point where they start splitting open. You know what I'm talking about? And those juices start coming out. And I, I love that. I love that. Do you want to know what I don't want to know about bratwurst? How they're made. I don't want to know. I do not want to know how a bratwurst is made. I have no interest in that information whatsoever. Um, I've had plenty of people offer to tell me how they were made. But I choose to ignore those parts of the conversation. I don't want to know how a bratwurst is made. No, don't want to know. I, will, I watch them on the grill. And when they start opening up, like, oh, they're, they're ripe and ready for harvest. It's time to eat the bratwurst. Somebody come up and say, you want to know how those are made? No, you're, you're not even welcome here. Go away. <laughs> I don't want that information. I don't want the truth. I'm perfectly happy with the information I have. 
They taste delicious. They're splitting open. It's time to eat. That's all the information I need. I don't want to know the rest of it. I like what I like, and I don't want to hear the backstory. I don't want the backstory on a bratwurst. Don't want to know where they came from. I'm just happy I have them in my possession and I get to eat them. Okay? That's my personal opinion on this. My prayer is this morning that no matter how you see Easter this morning, our hearts will be open to the way God sees Easter this morning. Most people's beliefs are based on what they want to hear, not necessarily on the truth. And if you think about it, most of our beliefs are based on our desires. I want to believe it's true. So therefore, I believe this or I believe that. Most people's beliefs are based on what they want to hear, not necessarily on what's true. But what is absolute truth cannot be changed. You can't change what is absolutely true. We need food and water to live. Our bodies require sleep. Our bodies age and become frail. We don't have to like these things, nor do we have to believe them. But it doesn't change the fact that they're true. It's just the truth. What is absolutely true, you cannot change. We, we can't change that. The truth is the truth. You don't have to believe it. But the great thing about truth is you don't have to believe it to make it true. It's true whether you believe it or not. What is true is true. I may not want the information about how bratwurst are made. But when it comes to the important things in life, I want the honest truth. Because there are some things that we just cannot afford to ignore. There are some things we do need the backstory. We need to know these things. This morning, I'd like to take us all to the backstory of what Easter is all about. And I was, I was thinking about preaching a sermon this morning, and then I decided not to. I'm not going to preach a sermon this morning. I just want to tell a story. I just want to tell the Easter story. Easter is all about what happened when, to a man who made an impossible claim, a completely impossible claim. Jesus Christ made the most outlandish claim that anyone has ever made. It's insane. Think about the claim that he made. He claimed that he was not only God, but that he would rise from the dead on the third day after his death and his tomb would be empty. That's a big claim. Tell me about yourself, Jesus. Well, I'm God. Like, okay. And I'm going to die for your sins. Okay. And on the third day after I die, I'm going to be not dead. I'm going to come back. That'll mess up a funeral real quick. You don't see that, especially since they've been, they've been gone for three days. They're now buried, and then they just decide they're not dead anymore, and they come back. That's an incredible claim. That is the most outlandish claim of all time. Jesus made the biggest claim. I am God. And I will die for your sins because I love you. And three days after I die, I will come back from that grave to show you that I can conquer death and hell for you. I am God, and I will keep my word. That's a, that's a huge claim. He said that he would conquer death and hell for us and that he would live again. Every culture around the world, every single culture acknowledges that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure. We all believe that Jesus Christ was a historical figure. You don't, have to, you don't have to believe that he was God, but every culture around the world does understand that Jesus Christ was a figure in history. Even your calendar recognizes Jesus Christ. We have A.D. and B.C. years. B.C. stands for before Christ. Even your calendar, just go home and look at the date. Your date says that Jesus Christ existed. Before Christ is what BC stands for. That means it's been 2,018 years since Christ came to this earth for us. Before Christ's years, we have, now we have 2,018 years since Christ. Anno Domini is what that is. It's called the year, it's a Latin word for the year of. So it is now the year of 2018. But that BC means before Christ. So everybody, even your calendar, acknowledges that Jesus Christ was a historical figure. So yes, we admit as people that Jesus existed, but what about his claims? What about what he claimed he was and what he would do? Jesus' claims were so incredible that if they were not true, he would have destroyed countless lives. He would have destroyed them. He would either fulfill his promise of an empty tomb or would he, he would just deliver an empty promise. One or the other. When you make a claim like that, you're going to deliver one of those two things. You're either going to deliver the promise of the empty tomb, 
or you're just delivering an empty promise. And lives will be destroyed based on that promise because he had many followers. People followed him believing this was true. Paul makes a devastating statement in 1 Corinthians 15. Let's look at that verse in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead like he said he was going to do, what a miserable existence we have. If we can only believe in him in this life and there's no promise of anything after death. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ never happened, those who put their faith in him have died and gone to hell because the whole thing was a hoax. That's a huge claim and it's a huge price to pay for all the people that follow Jesus. This is quite a claim that Jesus is making here. If Jesus was not who he said he was and could not do what he said he would do, then he would have been the most sinister, one of the most sinister people of all time because he knew he was lying. He knew, he knew he was telling a lie and people were following him. But Jesus was who he said he was and he did what he said he would do. So he was not sinister. He was an amazing person. Amazing. I want to take a look at some people in the Easter story that, have, that are often overlooked. I want to take a different avenue this year. We talk about Jesus. We talk about the disciples that go to the tomb. We talk about the women that go to the tomb first thing in the morning to, uh, to prepare the body of Jesus just to, just to go and uh, put those oils on him and stuff. And they get there and there's nobody in the tomb. <laughs> we talk about these characters in the Bible. But this morning I want to take a, a different path. I want to talk about the Roman soldiers. A lot of times we don't focus on them at Easter, and not this, this year I'd like to do that. They had a job to do, and that's the only part they have during the week of Jesus' trials and execution. They just had a job to do. But their story goes so much deeper than just that job that they had to do. We're not just looking at their employment. Their story goes a lot deeper. Soldiers were set in place for crowd control, for the execution of the prisoner, and for guard de detail if necessary. That's what they're there for. They had no emotional connection to the person that they were crucifying. They were desensitized to human life. They had seen torture at its worst. These people, it was just a job to them. The torture that they put another human being through became just going to work. Just going to work. You watch the person in excruciating pain and you just look at them, you become de desensitized to it. You're just dead inside to that whole situation. You're just doing your job. These people became cold. They just did their job. Every one of them knew the routine and they knew what Jesus had gone through all the way to that cross. They've done it many times. Many of them participated in his beatings and his humiliation. These Roman soldiers. It was by their hands that Jesus was beaten with the cat of nine tails. Now I don't want to get into a lot of the gruesome details of Easter, but I do want to let us, everybody know a little bit of what Jesus Christ did for us. A cat of nine tails is a handle with nine whips that come out of that one handle. And inside of those whips, there is, there's rocks and glass. There's sharp pieces woven into the whip itself. And at the end of the whip, there would be a, a metal hook. And they would take that handle with those nine whips and they would hit the person and it would wrap around their body and those hooks would stick into the flesh. And then they would just yank it back off and it would remove meat from the person's body. And I'm not trying to be grotesque here. It's just, and that's just a small detail of what Jesus Christ went through for us. It was by these Roman soldiers' hands that Jesus held on as they whipped him and took the flesh off of his body. It was the soldiers who crushed the crowns and thorns into his head. They mocked him as, he, oh, you want to be king? Let's make you king. And they put a robe on him and they, cr they crushed a crown of thorns into his head. They just crushed it down, just beat that crown of thorns right into his head. They're the ones who forced him to carry his cross until he didn't have the strength to carry it anymore. And they had to ask for help. Had they made somebody else carry the cross the rest of the way? It was the Roman soldiers who did that. 
And it was these men who stretched Jesus' arms out and nailed him to that cross to suffer a torturous death designed to last for hours. It wasn't just death. It was designed to be torture where the person would last for hours, sometimes days, on that cross. These were the Roman soldiers. These are the people I want to talk about. I want to take the Easter story from their perspective this morning. Jesus' claims were well known, and it was the job of the soldiers to make sure that Jesus was dead and that his body could not be stolen by his followers, claiming that he actually rose from the dead. So you take this person, and you make sure he's dead. You put him in a tomb. His disciples come and steal that body and say, look, he rose from the dead. They, their job was to make sure this did not happen. Because then, if, then the followers would still be following Jesus Christ and the religious rulers wouldn't have the pull that they wanted and it might become a revolt against Rome. So the last thing we need is Jesus' claims to be set up so it looked like he was really God and he really did rise from the dead. So it's the Roman soldiers, that it's their job to make sure that this did not happen. They had no interest in the backstory of who Jesus was, but they were about to be introduced to it. Everything was about to be opened up to these Roman soldiers. The soldiers have seen Jesus throughout the trials and they knew of the false witnesses that were put against Jesus, the claims that were made against Jesus, and they knew about, they knew it was false witnesses that were brought. Jesus has accepted the pain and he has yet to lash out at anyone. And the soldiers are able to see this. Usually, a prisoner would lash out at the executioner. You hit me one time with that whip, it's on. I'm probably not just going to be patient and allow you to keep tormenting me. I'll, I'll try to fight back. And they're watching as Jesus has not lashed out once. Why is he doing it? Why is he taking it all? He's not fighting anybody. He's just taking the torment. This was unlike anything they had ever experienced because they usually watch people lash out at them and curse them. And some prisoners would curse them to the point where the soldiers would actually remove their tongues because of the constant cursing that would happen. And they would cut their tongue out. But they didn't have to do that with Jesus because he never said a word against them. He never lashed out at anyone. Jesus was carrying it all as if it, he had some mission to accomplish. And he just took it on. He paid the price. He took every bit of torment that they put on him. As they watched Jesus hanging on the cross, something very unusual happened at noon that day. Let's look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the, whole, over the land. That's from about noon to three o'clock, the sun refuses to shine. Now we could say that was an eclipse, but there's no such thing as an eclipse that lasts for three hours. Every, the, mo the motion still happens and the, before long. We, we just experienced one last year. It doesn't last long. Just take a moment and look at it. Unless you're in St. Joseph, we don't really do that. <laughs> we cover it up with clouds because we do our own thing here. But an eclipse doesn't last for three hours and we all know that. But this day, the sun refuses to shine for three hours. And it might sound like folklore, but it's also been recorded in secular history, not just religious history, not just church history, but this has been recorded in secular history as well. Lee Strobel was an, an attorney that was converted to Christianity while he was trying to prove Christianity wrong. The problem when you try to prove God wrong, a lot of evidence stacks up where you realize you're wrong. <laughs> because there's everything points to God. He was trying to prove Christianity wrong. In his book, The Case for Christ, he says that a historian named Thallus in AD 52 had referenced the darkness that the gospel spoke of in some of his works. Back in AD 52, they recorded the darkness that hit that land for those three hours. It was visible in Rome, Athens, and other Mediterranean cities as well and recorded. This darkness fell over those cities as well. Tertullian said that it was a cosmic world event. And Phlegon, a Greek author at that time, reported that it became as night during the sixth hour of the day and a great earthquake was felt in Bithynia and Nicaea. He said something weird happened that day. And he even recorded that it happened at the sixth hour, which the way we would translate that is at noon. They even recorded the time. Secular history reports this. 
the soldiers were there at the cross when all of this happened. These people were standing there at the cross when it happened. They were there when Jesus looked over, at the, cro over the crowd as they were mocking him and crucifying him, and they heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. They were putting a man to death who preached that we should love our enemies. And something felt wrong about this execution. He's not lashing out at anybody. He's taking the torment that we're putting on him. He's paying the price for something. He's taking it as if it was his job to do. He's not saying one evil word against any of us, and yet he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this is the same man that preaches, love your enemies. Why are we killing him? That's the question that would go through your mind. Why are we killing this guy? We even know that the witnesses that were against him during the trial were false witnesses. We understand the whole, the whole production that we put out there to kill this man. And the question would cross your mind, why are we killing him? Why is he praying for us on that cross? Why isn't he lashing out at us? Why is he taking this? He's taking every little bit of it. There's something different about this guy. Something's different about Jesus Christ. Three hours after the land went dark, Jesus died and the earth shook. And as those Roman centurions at the cross were standing there watching this whole thing, they got the message. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 54. It says, So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. The Roman soldiers said, Oh, we get it. He wouldn't lash out. We just killed an innocent man. He has got to be who he said he was. Truly, this was the Son of God. They saw the backstory, and they realized that Jesus was God in the flesh who had just died for their sins. They got it. But the story isn't over. Remember, Jesus did not just claim to be God. He claimed that he would die for our sins and rise again on the third day. The claim is getting a little specific here. He gave details. Anyone can claim to be God and be murdered. Any one of us could do that. We could claim to be God and be murdered, but the true evidence would be if we were able to rise from the dead on that third day. Not only am I going to rise from the dead, but I'm going to do it on early on the third day. I'm going to do it that day. That's pretty specific. Dead men, men don't really fulfill their promises. <laughs> but he said, even after I'm dead, I will keep my promise, and I will rise on the third day. This is where all the party tricks get thrown out the window. This is going to have to be a God thing if this was going to happen. Dead people don't do anything. This is going to have to be a miracle. This is going to have to be a God thing if you're going to keep that promise, Jesus, because once you're dead, you're dead. You can't fulfill anything else. And he says, I'll be back. Three days, and I will rise again. The political and religious rulers of that day hated Jesus, and they were not about to allow this to happen. And of course, they didn't believe that Jesus was God, nor that he was going to rise from the dead. They didn't believe this claim anyway. But they were suspicious that his followers would want to make it look like it actually happened, steal his body and say, look, he did rise from the dead. So they had to set up a plan. And this is where the story gets really goosebumpy. And I love, I love what God put in the Bible so we could see historically and biblically what happens here. This is where it gets fun. Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and placed in a tomb. But it had to be protected. Otherwise, if it was stolen, they would claim that he rose again. And that cannot happen. They're not going to let this happen. So look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62. It said, On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore, command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. They go up to Pilate, who is in charge of this whole thing, 
Actually, let's step back. God was in charge of the whole thing. Pilate just thought he had something going on. They go to Pilate and say, if his disciples come and steal his body, they're going to say he rose from the dead, and we can't allow that to happen. That can't be allowed to happen, because then the, the last deception will be worse than the first, and we can't allow this to go on. So Pilate said, okay, I'll, get, I'll give you a guard, and you can set that guard. So let's look at what takes place in order to secure the fact that Jesus made this claim, and they cannot let this happen. Let's look at the details here a little deeper this morning. To assure that his body was not stolen, a two-ton stone would be rolled in front of the doorway of the tomb into a small trench. I'm thinking we have a problem right there if we want to steal the body. A two-ton stone is rolled in front of that door into a small trench in front of that doorway. So it rolls down into this. Now, in order to get that out of the way, you're going to have to pull or pull or push a two-ton stone up out of a trench in front of this door. So they put a stone in front of the door, and it was sealed with a Roman seal and heavily guarded day and night. Now, a basic squadron of soldiers would be about 24 for this situation. You're going to need about 24 soldiers to secure this. Now, 12 of these soldiers would stand in a semicircle in front of the door of the tomb. They would just form a semicircle. The tomb's here. They would stand in front of it, guarding that, the, the door of the tomb. Now, the other 12 soldiers would lay down on the ground behind them and sleep. So when the shift changes, the sh soldiers that are sleeping would then stand up and form the semicircle, protecting the soldiers behind them who would now sleep. And they would do this day and night to make sure it's at constant watch and nobody's going to get past them to, to remove that stone. Not only that, but they are heavily armed soldiers. They're not just a bunch of men standing there. They're heavily armed soldiers. They were not about to let anybody steal the body of Jesus and claim that he had risen from the dead. This would have only offered validity to Jesus' claim, and political and religious leaders did not want that to happen. So in order to steal the body of Jesus Christ they would have to take out the 12 heavily armed soldiers who were awake without waking the others who were behind them. Then they would need to sneak past the sleeping soldiers, break the seal, and roll a two-ton stone out of a trench, take the body, and sneak out past the sleeping soldiers again. And that would be impressive. That would be extremely impressive. And that is exactly what did not happen. The tomb was secure. They made sure nobody is stealing the body of Jesus Christ. They secured this. So let's look at what did happen. On the third day after Jesus' death, the Roman guards got another surprise. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 2. Let's look at this verse here. It says, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Now they didn't die, they just became like dead men. They fell back and were like in a state of paralysis. They're scared. They're scared. And you know what? I don't blame them. I do not blame them. The soldiers were terrified. They become like dead men. And this is the second set of Roman soldiers that we're looking at. The first set of some Roman soldiers we looked at were standing at the cross. And what was their response? Truly, this was the Son of God. Second set of soldiers are standing here. And we see in their story that their response is completely different. They just saw the Son of God rise from the dead. And it was their job to make sure his body did not get out. And failure to secure the tomb was punishable by death. They know if that body is stolen, you'll take their place. And they understood the price of not doing their job. They understood, we'll die if we don't do our job, so we will make sure this tomb is secure. Now the body's gone. The stone just rolled away. They saw that everything just happened. The earth shakes. They fall down as dead men, just, just like dead men. They're watching this happen. But look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 2. The details, a great earthquake, an angel shows up. The stone is rolled away. <laughs> this is freaky stuff. 
This, this will wake you up real quick. Look at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 11. Let's look at the next verse here. Matthew 28 and verse 11. It says, Now while they were going, they go, they're going to Pilate. They're going to talk about what just happened, okay? While they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he, we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ear, we will, we, will, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Here's the other response. The soldiers come and say, hey, let me tell you what happened. We were doing our job. We had the 12 here. We had the 12 sleeping behind us. The earth shook. An angel shows up and rolls that two-ton stone out of that trench. And we freaked out. <laughs> and the body's gone. And nobody stole it. That's really what happened. And they said, we're going to give you a lot of money. Right now, we're going to offer you a lot of money if you will just tell people that the disciples stole the body. And if it gets to the governor's ears, we will protect you so you're, you don't have to die. And they took the money. And it says at the very end there that this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. The soldiers were given a choice and they chose to defend a lie. They saw the event, and they knew the truth, and they were perfectly happy believing what they wanted to believe. Historically, it's hard to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he did not rise from the dead, the Roman authorities would have produced the body in order to prove that he did not rise from the dead. If everybody said, oh yeah, he rose, they would have produced the body to show that it was a lie. But they didn't have a body to produce. Or they would have done it. If his body was truly stolen, it would have created an intense scene because of the effort it would have taken to steal it. And the soldiers would have been executed for disobeying their orders. Not only that, but Jesus' disciples died martyrs' deaths because they refused to deny the truth. Now why would all these men choose to die the horrific deaths that they died for something they knew was a lie? They wouldn't have done it. They died because it was true, and people need to know the truth. For 40 days after Jesus rose from the dead, we have hundreds of eyewitnesses who saw Jesus and spoke with him. The evidence is just piling up. There is more evidence to support the resurrection of Jesus Christ than any other case in all of history. And it, and it just keeps going. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This is the backstory of the holiday that we call Easter. This is the backstory. Now we're presented with a choice. We can either choose to accept him or reject him. We have the same choice that everybody else had. Jesus came to this earth to pay the ultimate price for our sins so that we could be saved for all eternity. We have the example of two different sets of soldiers here. One set stated that truly this was the Son of God. And the others took a bribe of pleasures and denied what they knew was true. Paul made that, that he wrote that scripture that we showed at the beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'd like you to look at that scripture one more time with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 16. For if the dead do not rise then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we're just following a man that said he was God. But he couldn't even conquer death. So what hope do we have after death? If there's no life after death, Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the people that followed Jesus Christ died and went to hell. There's no hope. 
There's nothing being offered to us. They died and went to hell, and we're believing in this. So we are, of all men, the most pitiable because there's no validity to the claim. But there is validity to the claim. His body could not be stolen. He actually did rise from the dead. We celebrate this on Easter. It's the resurrection celebration. It's not just Easter Sunday. This is resurrection Sunday. This is the fact that we celebrate the fact that our God did not only come down and claim to be God and die for our sins like anybody could do. Anybody can claim to be God and die. That's easy. But that he rose from the dead and said, I can conquer death and hell. I paid the price for your sins on the cross. And if you will accept the price that I paid for you, then I will save you from your sins and you will be saved for all eternity. But if you reject what I did for you, then you will have to pay that price yourself. And that is an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. And I didn't want you to go there so much that I would rather die than live without you. And that's exactly what he did. He died for you. And he died for me. And death wasn't enough. He said, watch this next thing. I'm not only going to die. I'm coming back to show you I've got this. Death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. You could have put millions of soldiers in front of that tomb and they would not have been able to stop what happened that day. Because he is God. And he did love you enough to take your place. Now here's the question. Will you accept the price that he paid for your sins because he paid it in full? Or you, re you reject that price and that means it's still got to be paid but now it will be paid by you instead of him. That's a lot of love. He never lashed out at anybody. He took it even though he was undeserving. He took it. A price that you should have paid he paid it for you. He took it. Substitutionary sacrifice. They deserve it. Put it on me. Because I love them. And I'd rather die than live without them. He wants a relationship with you. If Jesus had not accomplished everything that he claimed, we would have been left to just try to get to heaven by doing our best. By our own power. And none of us can accomplish that. Because the problem is you can't erase the sins that you've already committed. There's nothing you can do to erase those. But Jesus Christ can go up to the Father, God the Father, and say, hey, they accepted me as their personal Savior. They accepted the price that I paid for them on the cross. And God says, then the sins are paid for and wipes it clean. So when you die, God looks in that book. He says, I can't find any sin against you. There's no sin here. Where did it go? Your son took them. Come on in. Come on in. Now you can come to heaven, not because of anything you did, but because of everything that Jesus Christ did for you. Enter the joy of your salvation. That's how we get to heaven. It's not anything that we do. It's what he did. It's not the price that you pay. It's the price that he paid. The innocent for the guilty. And he was willing to do it because he loves you. If there was any other way, God would not have allowed his son to go through a, such a torturous death. But it was the only way. The price had to be paid. And he took it. He took your debt and he paid it for you. But you can reject him. You do have that choice. As Kim sang earlier, that song, So Will I. It gives us an option. Creation obeys you. Now you have the option. Will you obey him too? All of creation obeys God. So will I. Because you died and rose again, so will I. Because I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ. The innocent died for the guilty. The sinless paid the price for the sinner. God sacrificed himself to save mankind from their sins. And death and hell were conquered for your sake. Now it's just a free gift that's being offered. Now it's just up to you to take it. You accept the gift. You don't pay for a gift. The gift's already paid for by the time it's offered to you. This one was paid for, and now it's offered. John 3, 16. Let's look at this verse. This is one of the most popular verses. But we can't go through Easter here without pointing this out. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I love you enough that I'll let my own son take the price because he loves you so much to do it. And I'll let him do it for you. I want to point out one thing that Jesus said in the last book of the Bible, but this is, a, this is the words of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. I've got them. I've got the keys. And I will let you out. I will let you out. Just say, I accept the gift. He says, I release you because you put your faith in Jesus Christ and asked him to come in and save you from your sins. The price has been paid. It's been paid in full. You don't have to do anything. He did it all. Easter was a gift of salvation for the world. There's the backstory of the holiday that we celebrate. Now it comes down to a choice. Just a choice. If you rose from the dead, so can I. And it's based on whether or not I will yield and ask you to come into my life and forgive me of my sin. The price has been paid. Will you accept the price? Stand with me this morning.